live. Okay. I think first of all, we can all say hello and introduce ourselves the the healthcare for all team, which is starting with Betty. To start with Erica. Um, well, hello, everybody. My name is Erica Ferriston. My pronouns are she, her. I am Director of Healthcare for All Los Angeles, along with Maureen Cruz, and I am co-chair of our chapter, along with Betty Dumas-Toto. Okay. Going to add me in there. Hello, everybody. <laughs> if you haven't guessed so far, I am the tech person that my computer took a dump right before we... <laughs> started but Betty Dumas Toto um, she they I live on Tongva land and and I'm very very happy to have you all here so we can go a deep deep dive on AB 1400 we're going to get wonky with it today mm -hmm. that's what we're doing <laughs> hi it's Maureen Cruz I'm also a director along with um, Betty for the, the Los Angeles chapter of healthcare for all um, Ron want to say hi and Paul uh Hi, Ron Birnbaum, um, PNHP California, and also um, part of the group leadership group Healthcare for All. And Paul? Um, Hi, I'm Paul He Him, and uh, I do the website for Healthcare for All Los Angeles. Okay, so we have a little bit of housekeeping that Betty's going to go over. Yes, um, please keep muted um, while the speakers, especially while the speakers are speaking. Um, uh, we do have a chat and Erica will be taking questions. Um, so send those to her. Um, if you can send it directly to Erica, um, if you know how to do that, you go into the chat, you just go into where it says everyone and change it to Erica and she will be curating those questions. We'll try to answer as many of those as possible. Um, I believe the questions will be held towards the end. You can correct me, Maureen, if that's not the case, towards the end of every all the speakers together. Um, and um, yeah, just you know, keep keep muted um, uh, and put your questions in the chat for the for the most part. Um, yeah, and that should be it. So I want to welcome everybody to this to this meeting. Thank you all for making it. We're very happy you could. Um, Healthcare for All Los Angeles is a chapter of the statewide organization, Healthcare for All California, which is dedicated to achieving universal healthcare system through single payer financing. Our goal is that all California residents have equal access to comprehensive, high quality care over our entire lifespan. And all means all. Um, beyond any doubt, COVID has demonstrated to us that from the beginning to end, we are all in this life together. There are a lot of people on a very small planet and acknowledging the injustice, the indignity, the irrationality, the bigotry, and the serious harm of our current for-profit health insurance system is now unavoidable. Uh, industry business plans profiting from our vulnerability and needs have replaced professional judgment. Profit has removed the priority of care from our health insurance system. And we must put care back into the healthcare system. Lack of uh, cost transparency and the absence of price controls have left us vulnerable to deception, graft and greed, now. resulting in economic devastation for many. We must not continue to allow our lives to be used as commodities. We are not profit centers. Tiered systems of care are apartheid, penthouse care for some, bargain basement for others, and no care for the very unlucky. It is a caste system. We are in a caste system. So separate is never equal, and single payer includes all of us. Everybody in, nobody out. Incremental piecemeal fixes delay genuine systemic solutions. Band-aids for cancer don't just delay the cure, they allow the damage to metastasize. So the Reverend Martin Luther King reminded us that in the face of human suffering, we must embrace the fierce urgency of now. And so we are very excited and enthusiastic uh, in this moment of now that the California Nurses Association has introduced genuine high quality single payer legislation, AB 1400. We are fortunate to have two expert panelists 
to give us their assessments of this new healthcare legislation. And it is my pleasure to introduce one of our treasured healthcare for all leadership team members, Dr. Ron Birnbaum, physician, political activist, family man, and healthcare justice advocate. A graduate of the UC San Francisco School of Medicine, Ron specializes in dermatology, dedicating his career to the needs of the underserved communities in the Los Angeles County. Currently, he is both teaching and seeing patients as faculty at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Dr. Birnbaum was the former division chief and residency director at Eisner Health, a federally qualified health center in downtown LA and he's currently serving patients at Kedron Health in South Los Angeles. Active in Democratic Party politics as a delegate to the state and local party central committees, Ron was a Sanders pledged delegate to the DNC where he voted a resounding no on the platform when Medicare for All was removed. Dr. Birnbaum sits on the steering committees of PNHP California and the Southern California chapter. In 2017, he ran for the California Assembly, Assembly District 51 in Northeast LA, making single payer Medicare for all his campaign centerpiece. So hello, Ron, take it away. <laughs> Hi, and, and thank you, Maureen, and all you've done um, for putting this event together, which is nearly everything. And so, and as we're just gr so grateful for you and so grateful to have these two speakers today. It, it's really special to have them because Kip uh, and Jim, who I'll introduce shortly, have, have um, taken hard looks at essentially every American single payer bill ever. And then now um, to help us here, uh, the newly introduced AB 1400. And so from their presentations and your questions, we're going to get smarter today as activists. So first, we're going to be hearing from um, Mr. Kip Sullivan, JD. Kip is the current policy director of Minnesota Physicians for National Health Program. No, no, he's not. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, uh, that's the information that I had. I'm sorry. And it's, it has been researching and analyzing and writing about healthcare for um, over uh, over 35 years. He was um, he formerly served, and maybe I have this fact wrong, but you correct me, as health systems analyst for the Minnesota Universal Healthcare Coalition. He's been active with a variety of citizens health policy action organizations in New York and California and Minnesota. So he is a prolific and incisive author um, and has written comprehensively about uh, performance measures and quality assessments, um, hospital and insurance revenue data and healthcare costs. And his critiques and comparisons of both state and national healthcare legislation are considered sort of essential reading for single payer advocates. So he's written over 150 articles in journals and, and publications, including the, the New England Journal of Medicine, the New York Times, and others. He wrote the highly respected 2006 book, The, Hel this, the Healthcare Mess, How We Got Into It and How We'll Get Out of It. Uh, he went to college in Pomona, not far away, and got his law degree at Harvard. So um, thank you, Kip, and please, Take it away. Well, thank you very much. I, Maureen, you asked me for a bio. I didn't send you any of that. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I um, am going to um, uh, move very quickly over some complex topics. And um, I'm sure you, those of you who are new to the single payer movement may have a few questions when we're done. I think those of you who have been with the movement for a while will understand exactly what I'm saying. But um, I'm gonna move quickly. Uh, if some of you have questions when I'm done, that is totally understandable. Please ask them and I'd be happy to take questions um, by, uh, by some other format um, if, um, if that's necessary. Now, let me see, does everybody see what I've got here, a split screen? I mean, uh, my uh, slide show up? Yeah. Yes, yes it is. Okay, good. Uh, let me get it started here. Good. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, concentrate my remarks on the um, a cost containment section of AB 1400 um, because uh, it is that section that differs most markedly from the analogous sections in the four uh, previous bills that have been introduced uh, as single payer bills 
uh, since 2003. I've highlighted the, the major changes. There are many other good things to say about AB 1400 that I don't have time to say in my presentation. Here are the major changes. AB 1400 does not exempt HMOs, uh, they're called integrated delivery systems in previous bills, um, and, and by the way, in a lot of other publications. It prohibits um, capitation, I'm gonna explain that term later, and other methods of shifting risk off of the one payer, the CalCare board, and onto um, uh, HMOs, doctors or hospitals, and that's a good thing. And it authorizes budgets for hospitals and other institutional providers. <clears throat> I'm gonna say hospital budgets just for the sake of brevity uh, throughout this presentation, but uh, you should know that AB 1400 defines institutional provider as um, 10, I think 10 or 11 different types of providers. In addition to hospitals, the list includes um, nursing homes and um, hospices. Um, these three changes in, uh, make improvements in AB 1400 over the previous bills in two important respects. First, cost and in equity. AB 1400 achieves a greater reduction in administrative costs than previous bills for two reasons. One, it authorizes a single payer. Uh, it does that by not authorizing these, these HMOs called integrated delivery systems. And you see here in the uh, smaller uh, italicized text, um, an excerpt from AB 1400. You, it says a carrier that means an insurance company in California law and the law of many other states may not offer benefits that duplicate the coverage under CalCare. <clears throat> so essentially that's how uh, AB 1400 guarantees that, you, that we're talking about one payer for all doctors and hospitals and nursing homes in California. Secondly, AB 1400 authorizes hospital budgets. Um, and hospital budgets save money for the system and for hospitals because they reduce hospital administrative costs. And they do that by uh, eliminating the need for hospitals to keep track of every Band-Aid and blood draw and assign it to a particular patient. And here you see the provision in AB 1400 that authorizes institutional provider budgets. AB 1400 improves the equitable access to medical services two ways. First, it prohibits the use of capitation and other risk shifting schemes. It, the, the, there is not a provision in AB 1400 that says thou shalt not capitate, but the language is fairly clear and I, I would be surprised if this is an inaccurate statement. AB 1400 prohibits all forms of shifting risk off of the CalCare trust fund and onto anybody else, doctors, hospitals, HMOs. The second way AB 1400 improves um, equity is that it takes out of the hands of insurance companies and hospital chains um, the opportunity, the authority, the discretion to decide where medical resources go, hospitals, MRIs, obstetrics departments. All of that now is in the hands of the CalCare board. So uh, these, uh, these three changes um, are basically brought about by the fact that AB 1400 has all the elements of a single payer system. I've, I've used several types of jargon here, and I wanted to explain each one of them. I've said single payer, I've referred to integrated delivery systems, and I've talked about capitation. And I wanna make sure we're all on the same page of, of what those terms mean. Single payer did not enter the American lexicon until 1989. That was the year that uh, a new group called Physicians for National Health Program published an article in New England Journal of Medicine um, that was based on the Canadian system. The Canadian system has these four elements. One payer replaces multiple insurance companies. One payer negotiates budgets with institutional providers. It negotiates uniform fee schedules with doctors and it negotiates limits on drug prices. Um, since 1989, a large body of research has been published on just exactly how single payer systems like Canada save money and how much um, and second, and, and um, so much of the research has been on the Canadian system. The Medicare fee-for-service system has been a, a secondary source of research that helps us understand how a single-payer system with these elements saves money. Uh, Jim, by the way, has contributed a lot uh, uh, to that research. Uh, I've contributed two or three studies uh, myself. 
Um, now, uh, these three first elements, one payer, budgets for hospitals, and uniform fee schedules, they account for the largest savings that a single payer can achieve. I've arranged here in a fairly simplified form how single payer systems with those four elements um, save money. Um, the, uh, the biggest savings you see here is in administrative costs. Now, when you, I say percent, when I say 15% here, I mean that if we could implement a single payer system tomorrow at the state or federal level, we would cut administrative costs so much that total spending would drop by 15%. America's $3.8 trillion total medical bill, healthcare bill would drop by 15%. That savings is achieved roughly half and half in the insurer sector, insurance companies that is, self-insured employers, public programs like Medicare. And the other half comes from medical sector, doctors and hospitals. Most analysts uh, will attribute three or 4% more savings in, in the form of reduced drug prices. And they'll give you one or 2% savings in the form of reduced fraud. Um, if um, I, I, now I want, what I want to do is take a look at how those three features, one payer, hospital budgets, and uniform fee schedules for doctors achieves such large savings in the form of reduced administrative costs. This is a graphic prepared by AHIP, America's Health Insurance Plans, a smarmy name for the um, trade group that represents America's health insurance companies. And you'll see that they're saying, and this is an accurate uh, uh, estimate, that if you give an insurance company a dollar's worth of premiums, they will keep 20 to 21 cents to run their shop and they'll pay out 80 cents to doctors and hospitals. And um, this 18%, it consists of marketing costs, lobbying, telling doctors how to practice medicine, setting up networks every year, changing them, sending out directories that aren't valid the minute they come off the press, whopping salaries for executives. I'm, I'm probably missing something, but that's what uh, goes into this 18% operating costs. The net margin is a rubric that covers both profit and surplus for for-profit and non-profit insurance companies. Contrast this 20% overhead, this 20% administrative chunk with the um, uh, overhead costs, the administrative costs of the traditional Medicare program. The traditional Medicare program has only a 2% overhead cost. In other words, when you give the traditional Medicare program a dollar's worth of Part B premiums and taxes, they keep two cents to run their shop and they pay out 98 cents to doctors and hospitals. Now, this is a slightly oversimplified description of how savings uh, in the uh, insurer sector can be so high but it's a, it's a quick introduction. It gives you some idea of why the savings are so, so great. Now on to hospital budgets. In the US, hospitals spend 25% of their total spending. Now it's hospital spending, not national. 25% of hospital spending is devoted to administration. In single payer countries that also, that, that pay hospitals via budgets, Canada and Scotland are examples, hospitals devote only 12% of their expenditures to administrative costs. They are, in other words, half the administrative expenses of American hospitals. And finally, uniform fee schedules for physicians, same thing. In, in, in a single payer system, physicians are not dealing with multiple payers. For example, multiple HMOs, uh, integrated delivery systems, but, and are dealing with a single uniform fee schedule. And for those, those two reasons, Canadian doctors spend only one fourth as much as American doctors do um, dealing with payers. AB 1400 contains all four elements of a single payer system. One payer, no HMOs that are also called integrated delivery systems, budgets for hospitals, uniform fee schedules for doctors, and the authority to negotiate limits with drug companies. There are other excellent provisions in AB 1400 um, there's an explicit prohibition against prior authorization, in what's called step therapy. You've got to try statin A before the, the HMO will let you try statin B. Um, and it does not require referral, a referral from a primary care doctor. Let's come back to this if we have um, time. I want to uh, get to the last two major pieces of jargon that we all need to agree on, uh, integrated delivery system and capitation. Uh, in, in the course of explaining these terms, I'm going to give you three reasons why we really need to move heaven and earth 
to keep integrated delivery system loopholes out of AB 1400 and any other bill um, introduced in any state uh, that, that it is gonna be treated as a single payer bill. There are three reasons. First, the, the, the integrated delivery system label is extremely vague. It, it, I, I am fairly confident in saying this, the original authors meant to exempt Kaiser-like entities, not just Kaiser. But they wrote a loophole that's so vague it, that the lawyers for the industry will drive pretty much any insurance company that tries to micro, that can prove to a, uh, an administrative law judge that they try to micromanage doctors right straight through that loophole. Um, number, so reason number one, not to let an IDS loophole. Uh, even if even if the loophole were tight and there were only a few HMOs in it, you don't want it because it's going to drive up costs. And that's the second reason uh, you, you don't want a, uh, an exemption for integrated delivery systems or HMOs or any other risk bearing entity. Um, they drive up administrators costs much more than they cut medical spending. And third, they can't improve quality. Their proponents say they do. The research doesn't support them. Uh, and in particular, uh, Capitation premium payments. Capitation simply means a payment per person. And when you're talking about a payment per person to an HMO or an integrated delivery system in exchange for a promise to give those per that uh, person, that enrollee all the care they need in a coming year, that's, that's what insurance companies do. Um, and if you don't adjust the capitation premium payment to reflect the health status of the enrollee, you wind up vastly overpaying for the healthy not underpaying for the sick. This is an extremely important point. I don't know that I'm gonna have enough time tonight to, um, to walk you through the reason why that's true, but it is true. Uh, it, the entire Western world has been trying for almost a half century to come up with a method of quote unquote risk adjustment, a way of adjusting premium payments to insurance companies that accurately reflect the health of their enrollees so that the, the insurance companies don't have the incentive to cherry pick and lemon drop. Select the healthy and avoid the sick. And if they can't avoid the sick, deny necessary services. Those are the three reasons you want to avoid an integrated delivery system in future bills. Now here's the um, integrated delivery system loophole in the previous four bills. Integrated health care delivery system means an organization that meets both of the following criteria, is fully integrated operationally and clinically, is compensated using capitation. Now, capitation is a clear word. There's no difficulty understanding what that means. And I believe that it's ever wind, this bill, a bill with this loophole and it ever wound up in a court, a judge could figure out what integrated operationally means. It probably means the, the various hospitals and clinics and insurance companies all share a common management, common set of books. They've got the same corporate logo on their doors. But it's this phrase, clinically integrated, that is baffling. It simply cannot be defined, even though it's constantly used. I'm going to just make two offer you two quick slides to prove that statement. If the judge were to say, "Somebody, please find me an expert who knows how, what an integrated delivery system is," they don't exist. This if you is have from three minutes. Just want to uh, let you know, three minutes. Give okay. you a, a heads up. Um, there is no clear definition of what constitute, constitutes an IDS. This is from a literature review published in a journal that is quite sympathetic to managed care. Uh, if we have time, let's talk about this slide. Um, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission agrees it's impossible to define clinical integration. Here you see the comment by staff in response to questions from um, commissioners. Uh, I didn't, I just couldn't understand why uh, Senator Kuehl inserted the IDS loophole in her original bills. And of course it stayed in all the successor bills. And I wrote her in the summer of 2007, and I asked what, what were you intending to do here? And her assistant, Sarah Rogers, sent me a nice email back. And she said, we drafted at what was then called SB 840 to allow Kaiser to continue to operate, but we also want other Kaiser-like entities to thrive. And you know, that's a very vague term. The problem is you can, you can either write a loophole just for Kaiser or for the Kaiser-like entities. But if you write this loophole, it virtually every insurance company is gonna go through that. So vagueness is one reason you don't want to be using IDSs allowed in the bill. The other reason is there's no evidence that they work. 
This is a statement to that effect by a couple of well-known health policy analysts, I think at Wharton and the University of Chicago for the National Academy of Social Insurance. Um, here, I wrote a paper on this. I did a literature review. I found that HMO care was inferior to care offered by doctors who work outside of HMOs. Uh, this is one of the studies I, re I, I reviewed. It found a, a big difference in the quality of care between, for, el for the elderly, uh, much worse uh, for the elderly who were treated uh, by HMOs. Uh, and I, the last point I wanna make is that, um, so in addition to vagueness and that they don't work, is that they, they integrated uh, delivery systems have to be paid a capitation or premium. And as I said earlier, it is impossible to adjust the premium and capitation accurately uh, to avoid overpaying for the healthy and underpaying for the sick. And this is my last slide. This is how bad it is. In June 2014, the Medicare Pay Payment Advisory Commission reported to Congress that CMS, the agency that runs Medicare and Medicaid, has been trying for half a century to develop a risk adjuster, an algorithm that uh, adjusts premium payments to Medicare Advantage plans to um, reflect the health status of enrollees. They've been trying for half a century. They have failed miserably, and they'll never fix it. I can explain later why they'll never fix it if you're curious, but here's what they reported to Congress. If you divide the Medicare beneficiaries into quintiles, into fifths, the healthiest fifth down to the sickest fifth, Medicare currently overpays Medicare Advantage plans using their highly sophisticated risk adjuster by 62%, and they underpay for the sickest 1% by 29%. That's a tremendous incentive to cherry pick and lemon drop. And the result is the shifting of resources from the sick to the healthy the poor to the wealthy, and from minority populations to majority populations. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Kip. Yes, yes, thank you. And I, I just wanted everybody here to know that we're, we're going to be doing questions for both speakers after we hear from our second one, which is um, Dr. Jim Kahn. Um, Kip, if you could take down your slide sharing, I would appreciate that. Yeah, we hope. Um, but thank you very much. And so, um, uh, Dr. Khan is a uh, professor at, at the uh, Phil R. Lee Institute of Health uh, Policy Studies and the AIDS Research Institute and in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UC San Francisco, my alma mater, and is also a past president of the California Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. He is an expert in policy modeling in healthcare and cost effectiveness analysis and evidence-based medicine. I would say his 2020 um, paper um, is, was an instant classic, um, in the one in PLOS Medicine that said that projected cost of single payer, looked at projected cost of single payer healthcare financing in the United States. Um, I'm sure we're gonna hear about that a little bit from him. It settled a key question, I think, once and for all. So he got his um, MD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine and a master's degree from Berkeley um, and also did a preventive medicine residency. Um, he has um, been involved in uh, international uh, health care issues, global health, uh, lots of HIV AIDS, work for the CDC, um, and uh, it, we're just lucky to have him here, Jim. Thanks, Ron, and, and thanks, Maureen, for inviting me to participate today. I will keep my comments fairly brief because I'm really most interested in, in the discussion and uh, trying to address whatever questions people may have. Um, AB 1400 is a terrific bill. Uh, I think it's modeled mainly on uh, uh, HR 1384, uh, Representative Jayapal's bill, which is excellent. Uh, this is, these, are, these are single payer bills that cover everyone um, and do so with very broad coverage, including things that are sometimes considered peripheral like dental and, and vision um, and um, uh, the, there's no cost sharing, uh, of course, no premiums, uh, of course, no deductibles, but also no cost sharing. And um, the, the emphasis, as uh, Kip has described, is on fee-for-service payment of providers and global budgets for institutions, which is for sure a, an excellent way to organize a payment. It's been, been done in many other countries. Um, anyone who tells you that we cannot manage with fee-for-service medicine 
uh, either, either doesn't know what they're talking about or is trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Uh, so this, the, the proposed approaches in, in AB 1400 would work extremely well. And as my uh, colleagues and I showed in that January 2020 paper, which Ron referred to, uh, almost all evaluations of the cost of single payer find that uh, the savings due to administrative simplification, both on the payer side and on the provider side, uh, as well as other kinds of savings like lower drug prices and possibly some fraud reduction, all of those things are much greater than the added cost due to uh, the fact that people are covered better and may use more services. In fact, uh, Adam Gaffney and, and David Himmelstein and Steffi Wilhandler and I had a piece more recently, this January, that looked at the evidence for utilization increases with broad coverage expansions. And what we found is that the, the increases in utilization were even smaller than all of those studies assumed. And so if we were to take that into account, the, the net savings from single payer are very substantial, probably on the order of five to 8% of healthcare spending. So anyone who says we can't afford single payer uh, has left out a word. What they meant to say was we can't not afford single payer. Um, really single payer uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, a, a brilliant, effective thing. It's one of those truly rare, uh, perhaps unheard of instances in economics where we can have our cake and eat it too, where there is such a thing as a free lunch. We can provide high quality care for everyone without cost sharing and still save money. I would like to brag that this is some sort of revelation for we smart health economists in the United States, but no, as is usual, um, we are just lagging behind the rest of the country on certain important social policy areas and sorry, the rest of the world the rest of the world, the other wealthy democracies, the OECD, so European countries, New Zealand, Australia, many Asian countries um, have found uh, that having a single identical benefit package for everyone and making everyone covered and simplifying the process, the administrative process uh, results in lower spending lower rates of growth in spending and better longevity in health. So it's kind of a no brainer. We really should be doing it. In fact, if you listen to President Obama on uh, YouTube or read his book, his memoir, uh, he too endorses single payer. His argument was that we are subject to path dependence. We couldn't deviate from the historical path. I think that was um, uh, an unfortunate uh, decision. And, and of course, we're still fighting the battle for single payer. So the AB1, A1400 is an excellent um, in recent installment in this battle. Of course, we're waiting to hear what the financing plan is. And I and others are certainly looking at potential ways to finance single payer. I have no particular connection to AB1400, but I am working on financing possibilities. Um, but I would say that the precise financing, whether it relies primarily on payroll or primarily on high income taxes on high income or primarily on wealth taxes or some mix of all of those is not that important. There are many different ways to uh, get the money needed for single payer into the, uh, into the budget, into the funds. I think there is a massive challenge for any state um, uh, a single payer plan, and that is getting the federal government to go along with the kinds of actions needed to make the, the program really a single payer. So what that means is that the government has, the federal government needs to allow for the vast majority of federally or partially federally funded programs to be folded into the single payer. And there are some efforts in AB 1400 to anticipate this, but as, as Kip, I'm sure will explain because he's a lawyer and I'm not, uh, the restrictions on the use of Medicare and Medicaid and many other federal funding streams, the, the, the restrictions to putting that into the state pot of money are very uh, uh, substantial, very challenging. But nonetheless, I think 1400 is great. And again, I, I, I think the fee-for-service approach adopted is excellent. 
let me now come to the one point on which Kip and I uh, respectfully disagree. I do not think, and nor does the leadership of national PNHP think that a, a capitated uh, option is a disaster. We do not think it is a disaster. And here's why. What's bad about capitation, what, what distorts it is two things. First of all, uh, the uh, use of uh, operating margins or profits toward uh, shareholders and, and or toward uh, very high executive salaries. Secondly, um, the uh, uh, capital investment decisions uh, 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 using those operating surpluses uh, are then up to currently are up to the people who run the IDS or HMO or whatever you want to call it. Those are both highly distorting situations. And if you can have a capitated system, a group of doctors who want to be paid via capitation, but the uh, operating margins do not go to shareholders, do not go to capital investments, um, and uh, do not go to sky high executive salaries, uh, we believe that, that those, that kind of situation can work. And, and fee for service, by the way, although it certainly can work, is not a perfect system either. So uh, the current bill does not anticipate uh, capitation being allowed. And again, I have no problem with that at all. I don't think we need capitation. But the question I put to people who are more politically savvy than me is, would we ever find ourselves in a situation where a state single payer bill could pass if and only if it had the support of Kaiser leadership, Kaiser docs, and Kaiser patients? That's a big group, particularly the Kaiser patients group is huge. Would that make the critical difference? I put to you that under that, in that situation, I would be quite willing to contemplate uh, designing IDS uh, integrated delivery systems in a way that avoids important um, uh, downsides and allows us to get to a single payer. I know Kip will vigorously disagree with me, uh, but uh, we agree on a lot of stuff too, in, including, I don't think you mentioned this, Kip, we're writing a paper right now on the, the disaster that is accountable care organizations. And we're hoping to get that out there in the literature soon. Uh, ACOs are actually something that are used with fee-for-service. So they're left, they are explicitly left out of AB 1400, another very strong feature of the bill. They are permitted in Bernie's Senate bill. So this is not a dead issue and we would like to kill it. We would like to kill the idea of ACOs, which have been an abject failure. Um, and uh, I can talk about that some more if people are interested. I think I'll stop there. Just wanna, you know, make sure the discussion, um, uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So, shoot. So th thank you for that. And uh, um, I am going to begin with a question, but before I do, I just, Kip, you gave a, like your kind of account of what was wrong with capitation in your view. I, um, but since Jim brought, sort of posed the question, was there anything else you wanted to say quickly before I ask a question and we open it up? Was there anything you wanted to re just reply to that? Yeah, I would, I would agree with Jim that it's better if you're capitating a nonprofit, but that's not uh, my criticism, whether, because uh, these days, I think they're in, in many parts of the healthcare system, there's no difference between the behavior of nonprofits and for-profits. Um, it's a bit of an overstatement. What I object to about capitation is there's no, there's no gain from it. That's what the research says. Um, and moreover, because we cannot accurately adjust the premiums so that we pay an HMO that gets a lot of sick people a lot more or, or, or a capitated group of docs a lot more who get a lot of sick people uh, and conversely a lot less, what you wind up doing is shifting uh, resources away from the sick and to the healthy. There's just no escaping it. And if we had evidence that capitation achieves cost containment and better care, I know we have anecdotes, but I just showed you a slide, but the research on balance does not support that claim. 
The good thing about the position that PNHP took a long time ago on uh, capitation is they would limit it to a very tiny HMO. The HMO that PNHP uh, uh, authorized, uh, endorsed in the old HR 676 is so tiny, no HMO in America would get through it. And so if, if you ask me, would I agree to let that go in if it would get us past a committee vote, I'd say absolutely yes. My worry is the minute you give them an inch, they're gonna try to rip that thinking open to make it uh, uh, a loophole to drive the insurance industry through. And I come back to my other point, which is I don't know how you define these things in a way that doesn't give lawyers uh, a field day taking you to court saying, well, if you let Kaiser in, you should have let in Sutter. Right. And Kim, I, I mean, I do think that the point that the bill does seem to restrict them at least answers a question for us in, as a practical matter right now. It, it, You're talking um, about AB 1400? About AB 1400. That's right. Yes, as Jim said, um, it, it's moved it, with AB 1400. Right. So um, right. let me pose a question. Just, can, Rick, uh, so, sorry, Ron, can I just quickly say, uh, uh, Kip, I have a proposal for another paper we could write once we get our current one uh, published. We will call it a colicky colloquy. <laughs> the colloquy is a dialogue between two, and the two of us are going to be colloquy with each other, but I think it's worth a try. I'm, I'm game. All right. We'll need All to right. get a gastroenterologist to moderate that one. <laughs> so, um, um, so a question for both of you, um, or, or, but either one of you might take it. Um, so in our last go-round um, in California, SB 562, um, there were important um, cost estimates put out for the bill. And so there was the one that was commissioned by, um, by CNA um, from Bob Pollan from UMass Amherst. And it said it was gonna be $331 billion. Um, so that was sort of one estimate. Then the state, the, the state legislative analyst looked at it and said, it's gonna be $400 billion. So, um, you know, those are those are important differences in that that's a lot of money. And also that $400 billion, and, and this sort of goes against the world experience and also your the findings in your paper, Jim, um, look like you're spending more. And 331 looks like you're spending less. So what kinds of assumptions lead to sure. those big differences in, in estimates? Okay. And what do you how do you think it'll play out with 1400? Yeah, so I, I can speak to that technically. First of all, the Senate ledge anal the, the Senate staff analysis was was from the standpoint of economic studies a joke. It was just it's a couple of pages. They didn't really explain their methods. They didn't really explain what they meant by 400 billion. They made it sound like this is 400 billion in, 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 in extra spending. Of course, it's not that. I mean, it was very confusing. And it was no one took it seriously. And when we did our review, we didn't include it because there was no study to include. Um, but you're right, the, the, the number they bandied about was quite a bit higher than Bob Poland's and, and, and team's number. Um, and uh, in general, Bob's number is much more credible. Uh, he had a, a good handle on uh, savings and administrative costs. He uh, allowed for modest, I think, slightly ambitious savings on fraud and wasteful practice. Um, but on the whole, I thought uh, you know Bob's uh, analysis was quite good, and his uh, their analysis when we compared it to twenty other published economic analyses was you know, well within the middle. It was a little bit more optimistic, but not problematically so. Um, and it was you know very thoughtful and very uh, careful. So I I think Bob's numbers are are much more realistic. And as I mentioned earlier. All of these studies assumed an increase in utilization, which now, based on our newer research, was probably too high. So I think you're going to see those savings might even increase a bit, will increase a bit, if you take that into account. Um, what will be the numbers that will be used when this becomes a public issue? Well, that's not a technical issue or not entirely a technical issue because, of course, there would be lots of people with, um, uh, with, with issues to push and perspectives to advocate for. Um, and so we, we in the economics community interested in, in single payer are constantly at work trying to uh, 
um, limit the ways in which people opposed to single payer can distort the numbers. And that was why we did the utilization paper, because we didn't want the Urban Institute to claim that utilization is going to go up by 20%, because there's no evidence for that. So we had to do it in writing, and we hope that they will feel constrained in future not to make things up anymore. Ron, I got a quick comment. Um, I, I urge people to take an, uh, another look. I, I think the uh, slide is going to be available in the video to take a look at that little slide I had showing how a single payer system with those four elements in it uh, saves money. Uh, if you were to look at the famous um, uh, hatchet job done by uh, the Mercatus Center on uh, Bernie's bill uh, that was released, I think, two years ago, you'll see, if you were to map it out, that they attribute almost no savings to administrative, to reduction in administrative costs, and they attribute almost all savings to an enormous reduction in provider income. And of course, that gives the right wing all the ammunition they want, which is single payer is just a way of giving the government the authority to squash physician and hospital income. And there's not really much savings anywhere else. We, we need to protect rural hospitals. This is a terrible idea. So I, I we might want to do trainings for people as to how to analyze studies that allegedly analyze single payer bills. And I have two recommendations for people who do them. One, tell us what your assumptions are. Don't just say, I'm studying a generic single payer bill and here are my findings. And I think it'd be great if all bills that attempt to estimate the net effect of single universal coverage under a single payer system on national or state spending would at the end say, now here's our explanation for why we did not say Minnesota or California or the US could get down to Canadian levels. Just take a shot at it, you know? It's amazing that study after study after study comes out and says it's only, we can only cut costs by five or 10, 20%, and you're still scratching your head wondering how is it that the Canadians and other people with universal coverage spend so much less? I'm not suggesting it's an easy question to answer, but they ought to take a shot at it. That's great. Thank you. Um, do we go? Should we go to a Facebook uh, question? Um, actually, I have several questions okay, here on right, Zoom, right. and I'm okay. going to start start it off. Um, so I just want to reiterate: um, we're not taking questions by raising hands. We're taking questions. If you would please type your question directly to me um, mm -hmm. in the Zoom chat. We also have uh, Jason, who will be taking questions. Uh, from our Facebook page. So I'm gonna start us off. The first question is from Kathleen Healy. What does AB 1400 mean for Kaiser? Well, um, I'll quickly answer that. Um, right now, if, if again, if it doesn't allow for capitation, Kaiser to survive would have to switch to a different model like a fee-for-service model. And I'm not saying they couldn't do that, um, they probably could. And so it would uh, depend on their decision about whether to go that direction or not. Yeah, if you, I am occasionally asked <clears throat> whether someone's going to send bulldozers and turn Kaiser clinics and hospitals into rubble. That's not going to happen. Um, everybody who wants to see a Kaiser doc or go to a Kaiser hospital still can. What will change is Kaiser's, the, the, um, Kaiser's ability to control um, uh, fee schedules for its doctors and the budgets for its hospitals. And I think Jim, you were saying you were agreeing with when we were talking about uh, HMOs. This is one of the things PNHP has talked about. Even on the eight, in a PNHP definition of an acceptable small HMO, it would be up to the single payer to tell all hospitals this is what your budget is. Kaiser would not be saying to their what twenty hospitals in, in California. Here's what our budget is. If you were to give Kaiser a budget for all of its, what, 18,000 doctors and 20 hospitals, what are you doing? You're giving up social control over the allocation of resources. Um, and you're introducing um, uh, more headaches for hospitals and uh, doctors because they'll be billing multiple HMOs, not just Kaiser. Um, if Kaiser, really did invent a better mousetrap. I'm a severe critic of Kaiser, but I also give them credit. 
they grew up, uh, I think of Kaiser the way, I think it was Jim Hightower talked about George Bush. Born on third base, think they hit a triple. They arose at a time when they had no competition and they had a healthy workforce. And they stepped into it in, into the battle arena with assets and advantages no other insurance company had. But they, they have used their unusual wealth in many ways that are very good. But they've created numerous problems. People have died because of Kaiser's restrictions on access to hospitals. They've had their hands amputated. They've been dumped on skid row. Uh, uh, what, what, we, what we don't want is uh, uh, large institutions like Kaiser making decisions based upon a hard uh, premium payment. And, if, and, if, and, then, and then what happens with, with the, any profits they make? That's another piece that is, was not discussed in previous bills. So um, um, my argument is that what will change in Kaiser is its control over resources. But if they have, in fact, they've, they've invented a better mousetrap. They actually have better doctors. Something about the communication between their clinics makes patients healthier. Then in fact, they're gonna get more more patients. And that should, be, that should be enough for everybody. Thank you. Jason, do you have a question from Facebook? If not, I have plenty more here. Yeah, I have a question I can ask. Um, are there term limits on CalCare board positions or can one serve endless terms? I believe the terms are limited. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I have another question here from Gina Harris. She's a nurse and she's on the HCA, HCALA leadership team. Her question is, how are costs over utilization contained in AB 1400 to ensure it doesn't exhaust funds? I'm not sure what overutilization means. Does it mean people getting services they don't need? I can okay. ask, I can, yeah, that was where I was going with that. It's just the like constant, like overuse of the healthcare system. The overuse so, problem is minimal compared to underuse. Um, it really is minimal. I mean, I can give you numerous examples and it's not limited to inexpensive flu shots, uh, uh, angiograms, uh, bypass surgery, grossly underused. Um, uh, so I, I would, I rely on the existing system, malpractice, uh, professional ethics amongst physicians, uh, patient preferences, um, and fraud. I mean, if there's somebody out there doing heart surgery unnecessarily, we're just going to have to rely on the threat of criminal and civil prosecution. Yeah, I, I understood the question a little differently, but maybe I misunderstood. And the question, the question is, what if the spending is over the budget, you know, maybe by the fall, or looks like we're going to exceed the budget? And I I confess I didn't read the bill carefully enough to see if it has its provisions, but normally there are, in the single payer bills, there are mechanisms to um, constrain basically elective medicine as a, as a, as a lever to convince, uh, uh, to con convince providers to be less uh, exuberant in the provision of services. But I don't know, I don't know for sure in, in 1400, I have to look. Well, in the description of the board's duties, there's a fairly extensive authorization to collect records on all providers. And the board is under an obligation to report regularly to the legislature on underuse, overuse, changes in quality. Um, that's what I, that's, I think that's the main answer to your question. One other thing we should keep in mind about overuse is when you give society control over the allocation of resources, it becomes possible to make sure that there isn't, there aren't four MRIs within four blocks of each other in wealthy communities and right. none in poorer communities. Right, so that's, what, that's the controlling capital investment. And, and correct. That's right. 
And that simultaneously addresses underuse and overuse. Jason, do you have a question from Facebook? Yes, I do. Um, let me ask this. Uh, ACOs are an abject failure. He's quoting what one of you had said. Sorry, what is an ACO? Yeah, an ACO is an accountable care organization is what it stands for. And it's basically an arrangement that um, the federal government, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services sets up to um, financially incentivize uh, groups of doctors who are, again, getting paid fee for service uh, to uh, reduce costs and while maintaining quality. And if they reduce costs, then the savings are shared between the doctors and uh, CMS. And uh, there were great ambitions for how much this would save. And they, you know, long story short, they have we've gone through, I think, five cycles of demonstration projects, and it's just never really accomplished much of anything. And maybe the history of it will help you understand the origin of yet another faith-based idea. Uh, I think you all recall something called the sustainable growth rate um, limitation. It was passed, I think, in late 90s by Congress. Rather than be concerned about gross overspending by the Medicare Advantage program, the part of Medicare that insurance companies participate in, they've been vastly overpaid ever since they got their nose in the Medicare tent. Rather than be concerned about the Medicare Advantage program, Congress obsessed about alleged overspending by the traditional fee-for-service Medicare program. In the 90s, they, they, they passed something called the Sustainable Growth Rate, I forget what, formula um, program. Basically, what it said was that if the if all doctors in America serving Medicare patients increase total spending from one year to the next in excess of some amount, I think the consumer price index, then all doctors would suffer a slight reduction in their reimbursements. It didn't work for the obvious reason that a doctor in Tulsa could, not, could care less what a doctor in New York is doing. And so in 2003, Congress passed a law that said to the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, come up with some method of breaking doctors into smaller pools so that it's, they're not in one pool of 800,000 doctors, break them up however you want, by specialty, by geography. And in 2006, the Medicaid Payment Advisory Commission came up with this harebrained idea of allowing doctors and hospitals to form little chains and the chains could call themselves an accountable care organization and then they'd apply to CMS for a, an ACO contract. And CMS, CMS would say, well, based upon the utilization of the people that we assign to you based upon your primary care visits, people don't know they're being assigned. We think you should spend this much per person next year. If you go over it, we take something, we, you suffer a loss. If you go under it, uh, you get to keep the savings. It's like HMOs, only a, arranged slightly differently. And just as HMOs fail to save money, ACOs are, are failing to save money. Okay, thank you, sirs. And by the way, they're encouraging massive consolidation. The system was consolidating rapidly prior to the authorization of ACOs by the Affordable Care Act in 2010. And I was just looking at the consolidation going on in California the last decade, it's just mind boggling, uh, but it's happening all over the country, thanks in large part to the um, endorsement of AC ACOs by the Affordable Care. Um, okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, Maureen, do we have time for another question? Um, yes, actually, we have another um, five minutes for questions. But I'd like to ask, since there are so many questions, if Kip and Jim are amenable to staying on maybe until even 530, um, we could extend um, this meeting. But it depends on Kip and Jim. I'm fine with that. Are you good? I, I am too. And I see some questions for me on the chat. I, yeah, there I don't are want to pay attention to them right now. I, I definitely want to get back to them somehow. Oh, we will get, we are going to save the chat and we will send it to you. 
Okay. Okay. So I okay, will so go on. For Betty, I want to check with Betty too. Betty, are you good with going to five thirty? Yeah, I'm. I'm fine. Just to let you know that um, uh, I am having some tech issues, so I'm not touching anything right now. <laughs> So I can't get into my Google browser to drop any links or glossary or anything like that because I can't get the documents. They're into the drives, and I don't know what is happening, so I'm not touching anything. Oh, thank you, Ron. I see it there. But, yeah, I'm fine with that as long as my Internet is fine with it. <laughs> okay. All right, then, since since the main parties here that need to do this are agreeable, um, we invite everyone to stay on till 530, um, and we will continue because this is a very robust an interesting conversation with incredible expertise that we don't have access to every day. So we okay, will continue so on and um, Ron, I'll let you know when the time comes up for the last um, question and comment, okay? All right, so I'm gonna continue on with the next um, Zoom question. It's from Robert McDuff. Um, is it politically possible to outlaw Kaiser? And is there any way to win the support of Kaiser patients, which is a significant portion of the voters in California, plus silence the Kaiser doctors and nurses from fighting against single payer? I'm just reading the questions, y'all. Well, it depends on how AB 1400 is characterized. Um, the reason I thought it was important to lay out the rationale for getting rid of that HMO loophole, the integrated delivery system loophole, is precisely because all of you and all of us who are cheering for you outside of California are going to be asked that question. Um, it, and it will depend upon whether people are persuaded that Governor Newsom will then send bulldozers to turn Kaiser clinics and hospitals into rubble. If in fact, nothing changes. I mean, for the average person walking into a clinic, nothing is going. To, everything's going to look the same. They're all going to be available. And as I said earlier, if in fact Kaiser does provide uh, better care, uh, I suspect that Kaiser, when all of its hospitals are getting budgets, will at long last uh, hire enough mental health care workers uh, so that people who enroll with Kaiser actually have access to adequate mental health. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't want to ramble too long. I, it's a very short answer. It'll depend on whether all of us who who approve of the removal of that integrated delivery system loophole can make the case that very little is going to change. And in fact, if anything changes at all, it's going to improve. Um, and um, and that quick people swiftly rebut uh, the mythology. I must say, in all the years that I've heard discussion about the, the role that Kaiser is playing in California, I've never heard anybody tell me what it is they think is supposed to happen. The implication is the National Guard will go to hospital, Kaiser hospitals and clinics and lock them up and you can't go. Beyond that, I don't know what people think the problem is. So I have a different kind of answer. And my kind of answer is I'm not a political strategist and we don't know enough about um, how people might be um, convinced that there's a, a good alternative with a, a bill that's under consideration. And I think that uh, while Kip, you're right, the many, many of these points may apply, um, I, I think the, the, what's really going to be required for a, any successful single payer bill in California uh, related to the Kaiser issues and related to everything else is a massive amount of money and professional political organizing, um, including assessing people's attitudes what they might accept, um, how different ad campaigns will play. So this isn't just a, you know, like we're going to have everyone in the room. This is going to be played out very much in, uh, in the media. And I think uh, whatever form the bill takes, that's going to be true. And, uh, and it's in that context that we'll be able to think about how to reach some critical mass of, of Kaiser patients. And the only thing I ask of any, any of you dealing with this very difficult issue. And I can only say, I'm glad I'm in Minnesota. I don't have to deal with a 20,000 pound gorilla like Kaiser looking over my shoulder. But for all of you, uh, I would urge you to go into this with your eyes open. Do not assume that that integrated delivery system loophole is the answer. Because if all you want to do is exempt Kaiser, then write a, write a provision in the bill. Kaiser is exempted and leave it at that. 
But if you, I understand why the authors probably don't want to do that. It, it inspires mockery. But then if you try to write it so that you have, you're only letting in Kaiser-like entities, if you write a bill as broad and vague, a provision as broad and vague as that integrated delivery system loophole that I showed you, you're basically saying you don't care about single payer. You, you don't, and, and so in order, to, so it's, it's a hard choice in order to achieve the savings that a single payer can achieve, you basically have to let in a whole lot of HMOs into the system uh, or let Kaiser in. But anyway, in any event, as you contemplate your choices, the politics of doing battle with Kaiser or the politics of give, give, giving in and exempting Kaiser and quote unquote Kaiser lookalikes, just go in with your eyes open. And when you lose in court and the lawyers persuade the judge to let in 40 or 50 Kaiser-like entities and you're looking at another multiplayer system, don't be surprised. Thank you. Jason, do you have a question from Facebook? Yes, I do. One moment. Does the global budget for an institutional provider include fees for the healthcare provider or are healthcare providers compensated uh, fee for service? And apologies if this has already been answered. Sorry, repeat, repeat the question. Does the global budget for an institutional provider include the fees for the healthcare provider or yes. are... Yes, yeah, yeah, it does. Now, um, yeah, so what, what if someone has, so let me, let me revise that. What if someone has admitting privileges? So they're, it, maybe that's what you're, maybe I misinterpreted your question. If someone say is a surgeon who, who, you know, may have admitting privileges at several hospitals and they come in to do a surgery uh, and they, you know, can they be paid separately for the professional services component of the surgery. And I, I take back my answer. I think probably they would be paid separately on a fee-for-service basis because it's the doctor, not the institution providing that aspect of the service. I believe that's the answer. But they could also that, employ surgeons who would be paid on salary. Yes. Could, Thank you. And, and if, it were, if it were otherwise, um, uh, Jim, you're back to, uh, the high administrative costs of paying everything per patient. No, 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 but 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 I think you would have to pay for the provide. Like if a surgeon does a three-hour no, surgery, they're going to they're going to be paid separately. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sirs. Okay, so I have another question here from Zoom. Chang Sim. This comes from Chang Sim Lin also on Healthcare for All Los Angeles leadership team. She asks, is there a difference between the IDS, Integrated Delivery Service, and ACO, Accountable Care Organization? What is the issue with the provision for ACOs in Bernie's Senate Medicare for All bill? The actual uh, label, AC, I'll, I'll take the first question, the second question, if I forget the first, remind me. Um, the actual label accountable care organization does not appear in Bernie's bill, but it is authorized by Bernie in a section, at least his bill last year, section 611B. It's a very short sentence, uh, paragraph. It says that once the bill takes effect, every so-called payment reform experiment that is underway in Medicare will be imposed on the entire country. And there are about 50 of them. And the biggest and most prominent is this accountable care organization experiment that as Jim said, it has flopped. Um, so that is that is how Bernie's bill would impose accountable care organizations. There are currently a little more than a thousand of them. Um, and they're not quite as big as insurance companies but they're all beginning to function like insurance companies because they, they bear risk. You can think of them as HMOs on training wheels. They split the risk of loss and profit with CMS. But everybody who promotes ACOs says, but we want to move along to the point where we pay them premiums and we can call them insurance companies. Now, what was the first question? 
Um, is there a difference between the IDS Integrated Delivery Service and ACO Accountable Care Organization? Uh, not now, and the reason is, according to uh, the previous uh, single payer bills in California, those integrated delivery systems would be paid per enrollee, that is a premium, a capitation, and all the risk then is on the IDSs, just like HMOs. We should just stop talking about IDSs and say HMO. So if they lose money, they suffer all the losses. If they make a buck, they keep it all. With the ACOs, they split losses and risks with um, CMS in the case of Medicare H ACOs and with Aetna or United because a lot of the private insurers are starting to sign ACO contracts with doctors and hospitals that serve private patients. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Dr. Bronston. If we ignore cost in deference to the policy of new revenue distribution, what would bring out all health debt and global budgeting, health professional public cost, secondary training to double the workforce and change its class, caste, racial narrowness? Bill, you gotta try again. I didn't yeah, come Bill, in. try again. That one's impenetrable. Sorry. Yeah. I've asked you to unmute, Bill. Dr. Bronston, unmute. There you are. So what I'm asking is if we look at paying all health debt out, buying out all the health debt. What's a health, what's health debt? Anybody who owes a dollar for any medical services in the state of California, we buy out. We just buy out all that debt. Okay. And we provide global budgets for all the post-secondary training institutions that are training healthcare professionals from therapists all the way through doctors in order to provide comprehensive tuition and we would then create that health workforce to uh, assign people to underserved areas. What would, would costs like that do to change the model of how we think about budget and market our single payer system? My, my point is that for us to be on the defensive about what healthcare costs is not to understand the strategic significance of the healthcare system and the overall uh, cultural economy of our lives. We're constantly defending something that should not be defended. And what, what we should really be looking at is a much larger picture of what ought to be in a single payer system that would really cover health care, that would include and bulk up the public health system, change the workforce, double the workforce, change its caste and class, and buy out all of the uncertainty and fear that comes with the health debt that exists there. Bill, can you, can you give us that the question just for the yeah, the question is, is what, what would the implications be of, of not worrying about what the cost is at this level and really open the door to a true uh, uh, address of the healthcare needs out there, of a healthcare system need out there? I think that our, our estimates are, are built on a very narrow model of single payer. And that model is not adequate to provide us with a comprehensive healthcare system anywhere in the state of California. It just changes a small piece of it. We got to change the way people are cared for. And the bill, every bill, every single payer bill I've ever seen gives the single payer board the authority to look carefully at uh, disparities and uh, shortages, shortages both of capital and right. Uh, workers. Right. Uh, now, you can't write a, a piece of legislation that tries to anticipate every problem that the board's going to encounter as the years go by. I understand that. I'm talking about at the front end, the front end, something sweeping that would really move people. So I want to make sure that we are like, we're sticking to our question format. And, and so I appreciate the, the statement though. Let me add a simpler question. No, no, but, but actually, no, we, we should really be fair and let the people ask questions who wanted to ask these first questions, important things you're bringing up. But. Where does purse care fit? Where's purse care? Let's check. Bill, let's do that. Let's do this by email. Why don't you condense what you're talking about by email and Jim and I can respond and pass it back to Maureen. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to, I need to check in with Jason. Do we have a Facebook question, Jason? Uh, not at this time. Thank you for asking. Okay. So I have a question um, from Sarah Roos. I don't know if I am pronouncing your name correctly. Um, it's all well and good to assert that anyone advocating for Kaiser and capitation is either wrong or ignorant. In real life, among the voters who are needed to support the idea of single payer, satisfaction with their own treatment is high, and these are likely almost by definition to be the less sick end of the spectrum for a variety of reasons. What would you say to your neighbor who argues vociferously in favor of Kaiser on the basis of their own personal satisfaction? I didn't hear the last part of that. I think we've addressed this. Go ahead, Jim. I would say, what is it you like about Kaiser? And um, you know, do you, do you do you think that's something special about Kaiser, or do you do you think that could be uh, addressed within um, a single payer system where you could go to any doctor? If their response and is, "I just want to be able to go to any doctor," then that's one discussion. If their response is, "I love the Kaiser model. I love the way they work." I trust that Kaiser has figured out how to take care of me. That's going to be a little bit impenetrable. And this comes to my general perspective on this. Kip, I'm sure you fully agree. Um, my, my, that question is typical of the kind of question I find difficult to reply to unless you engage in the kind of conversation Jim is suggesting. Tell us what it is you like about Kaiser and why you think it will change under a single payer. I, it, until I hear that, I don't know how to answer it. If you want, it, it, the question, the, 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 the question about uh, uh, what happens to Kaiser has to be more specific than that. If the reply is nothing changes, your clinics are open, the hospital is there, the workers are there, the premiums, the payment for your services is now coming from the government instead of your employer. But other than that, Nothing changes. And if, in fact, what you like about Kaiser is something they do that they've just got a better mousetrap, well, good. You should keep going there. But absent something more than this kind of a statement that I think you're going to send bulldozers and, and turn the hospitals and clinics into rubble, I don't know how to answer. Fair enough. Um... We have a question from Daniel Hodges. Um, Kip, why do you say that drug savings would only be about 2%? Well, keep, uh, keep it good, good to see you again. Uh, keep in mind that the, the measurement is as a percent of total national healthcare spending. You may be thinking of some other studies that measure the impact on drug spending alone. And in that case, yes, if you're looking just at the 10% the of spending, the 10% that the US spends on prescription drugs, that number may, the, the, the total, the, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing you again. If you look at the, the, the total amount of money that Americans spend on prescription drugs, and that's your denominator, yes, that will drop by a lot more than 2%. But that chart you saw was measuring in terms of total national healthcare spending. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Rebecca Gruba. I'm is there the last question, Erica? Thank you. Yeah. Is there a rollout plan for single payer, or is this still being researched for future implementation? I'm a SCC single payer volunteer in San Jose. Hi. Um, go, you want to go first, Kip? I'm having a hard time understanding the question. If you have, well, I, I think I understand the question. The question is, how do we get from here to there? Um, and I, I don't think that's specified in 1400. In any case, that normally uh, there's a short transition period of a year or two. Um, there's, you know, no particular advantage to long-term transition. And one of the issues that would need to be addressed um, is how to help people who will lose their jobs. So the, all of those administrators will um, need to uh, be retrained or retire early or whatever. And, and there needs to be a transition plan to help them. 
Uh, at the same time, if we are covering community-based long-term care assistance, which is part of, S of AB 1400, uh, we'll need to also make sure that we have the health personnel to be in position to do that. So there are, to my mind, the biggest issues, uh, most challenging issues are around uh, workforce. But of course, there will have to be administrative changes as well. I would just like to say there are a number of interesting comments here on the chat. Um, I really encourage people who want, who are asking this question, what will the, to, to help us understand what the concerns of Kaiser patients is. Um, at this point, all I can say is it sounds to me like there's a lot of fear mongering out there but maybe there's more to it than that. And I would urge you to help us understand what the concerns are. So um, let me um, begin to wrap us up. Um, and uh, although before we are all done, we're, we're going to be hearing from our Healthcare for All Los Angeles uh, director, Erica Ferriston, about how people who learn all this good stuff on this can take a very concrete action. But I, I, wanna, um, I want to remind everybody why we came together first of all, which is that we have had a catastrophe of a healthcare system in the United States and in California for decades. It continues to lead to excessive death, excessive suffering, excessive medical bankruptcy, and enormous draining of social resources in, in the service of those bad results. And that's stupid and cruel and it's been, it's been highly unequal. And I, I think if you listen carefully today, you're gonna pick up two really big um, take home messages, which is that AB 1400 is a real God fearing single payer bill by any definition. And, and then the second is that when people in your activism start to tell you that sounds great, but can we afford that? The answer is an unambiguous yes. And that's now been shown by looking all over the world as an empiric matter, but also in Jim Kahn's work, comprehensively reviewing the like economic theoretical analyses of all the plans. And this bill has no exception to that. So that I want you to take this, and there's a, lot, there's a lot more we all still need to learn, no question, questions about governance, many other, many other aspects of the bill for us to wrap our heads around. And we'll continue to develop ways to keep learning about it. I know the nurses will, PNHP will, healthcare for all will, but let's take this fight forward now, not sometime, but right now, Erica. Oh my gosh, you're firing me up. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers. Um, thank you, Dr. Ron Birnbaum. Okay, so Healthcare for All Los Angeles. Um, our chapter, we're a group, as Betty Dumas Toto likes to say, we are single-minded for single payer. And we are an organization um, we don't want to hear the talk, we want to see the walk. So, um, out of um, frustration for being in a holding pattern and tagging on to the excitement of the incoming Biden administration on New Year's Day, Healthcare for All Los Angeles kicked off a campaign, the first 100 days campaign, um, asking Governor Newsom to make good on his campaign promise to give California single payer health care and to do it within the first 100 days of the Biden administration. So we kicked that off New Year's Day and we're rolling along and then lo and behold, the nurses come riding in with their red capes and they bring us the CalCare bill. And we um, couldn't have been more excited so we adjusted our campaign it is all hands on deck on passing CalCare. So let me um, screen share here. I'm, I'm new at the screen share thing. Um, 
we've got this campaign, which now I think I'm screen sharing. We've got different actions you can take. The first and most important is um, check out the nurse's website. Check out their CalCare activities. We are linking up with the nurses. We are supporting their stuff. But in addition, we're also linking up to other organizations. Again, everything we can do to pass uh, the CalCare bill. One thing we can all do is call the governor. Um, tell him we want this bill to lobby his legislators to get on board, sign this bill. Another thing you can do is um, in line, the nurses are asking everybody to have legislative sessions with their assembly members. Yes, yes, and yes. And um, for those of you who can't do that, give them a call. Tell them you're a constituent. This is important to you. Tell them you want them to hold a town hall. Um, We've got a whole social media campaign. Um, this is where every day at about 12 o'clock, you can go on to Healthcare for All Los Angeles Facebook page. You can go on to our Twitter, to our Instagram page, which is HCA underscore Los Angeles. And you can like and share our social media post. We have a new post every day, all in support of CalCare. You can take a picture of yourself with a sign that you support CalCare. You can make a two minute or less video um, and hashtag my Medicare for all story. And you can just come on our website and click this join the campaign and you'll get everything you need to know. So um, that's pretty much it for our campaign. Um, I do want to just give a shout out, um, all the beautiful graphics you see here and that we put out on our social media, that is done by our marvelous Bronwyn Major. I think Paul is going to drop her chat, so just want to give her credit there. So please join us. I think I'm getting the nod from Maureen that that's my time. Please join us. Check out our social media. Like, share, visit our website, hcala.org, and join the campaign. Erica, can you can you scroll up so we can see the very first top of that? That's right. That's what we didn't get to see. There you go. The purpose of this campaign um, is to urge Governor Newsom to take significant steps towards implementing CalCare to lead the nation. Um, as it was said, we are the fifth... Uh, we are the world's fifth largest GDP. We are unique to lead this bill. Um, so let's let's lead it. CalCare in California, and then onward to Medicare for all. Maureen, I think you're on mute. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, panelists. Um, we are going to be sharing all of your chat questions with uh, Mr. Sullivan and Dr. Khan and Ron. So um, they will be able to see your questions and um, maybe they will have some responses. Um, we should probably do um, a second session of this since it was so popular. And I'm sure as the campaign unfolds, there will be more. So um, on behalf of Healthcare for All, we can, everybody can, uh, Los Angeles chapter, everybody can unmute and say thank you and goodbye and have a good evening. All right. Go California. Thank you, kid. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Goodbye. Love thank you. Thank you. Much love. Much love. Have a good night.